Good morning. Welcome to our worship service here this morning. Let's begin our service with a word of prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, thank you for your work in our lives. Father, thank you that we can be gathered together once again here in your house. Lord, ask that you would guide our service and that we would focus on you. Pray that we would um, be inspired and filled again. Lord, ask that you would be with those who aren't feeling well, who can't be here, that you would bless them where they're at. In Jesus' name, amen. This time we'll have three songs, after which I believe it's Spencer on for Devotions. Is that correct? Very well. Good morning. Hymns of the Church, number 13. Number 13, O come let us worship. Number 43. (laughs) Number 43. This is the day the Lord hath made.
161. All those who care to may stand. Number 161, this is my father's world. For devotional this morning, you can turn with me to Isaiah 9. I'm going to start reading in verse 8. Uh, I think we'll read till verse 14. Isaiah 9, verse 8. The Lord sent a word into Jacob, and it hath lighted upon Israel. And all the people shall know, even Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, The bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of reason against him and join his enemies together, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with open mouth. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts." Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. So this account talks a little bit about the pride of Ephraim and Samaria. I want to talk a little bit about something that goes right along with pride, and it's it's our ego. Uh, We've talked about, or we all have heard people use the word ego, and by definition, ego is simply our self as distinguished from others. It's how we view ourselves compared to others, which is not necessarily a good thing to judge ourselves by, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. But when we refer to ego, normally 
we're using it referring to someone who is using self-interest to validate an action or someone who talks about themselves too much. So ego is actually the Latin word for I. So that makes a lot of sense because often when we talk to people who use or who we would say have too big of an ego, most of their sentences start with I. And we all know that it's not fun to talk to someone who can only talk about themselves and never asks any questions about you, never listens to you. So we know how it feels to talk to someone or to interact with people who have too large of an ego. I want to look now at what God thinks about it. In verse 10, so remember that I said that ego is the same word as I in English. And in verse 10 it says, but we, same as I, just plural, we will build with hewn stones. And in verse, the end of that verse it says, we will change them into cedars. So the people of Ephraim here have a problem and they don't even give God a chance to help them. They just say, we're going we're gonna to rebuild with hewn stones. We're going to change the sycamores into cedars. And then God sees this and he has consequences for this. And we could read on further in the chapter. It just continues to detail what God's judgment is on them. But it, all of their enemies are, he puts them against them. And it says, Oh. And they shall devour, in verse 12, and they shall devour, devour Israel with open mouth. So he gives them no chance. Um, so we can see here that God has no time for people who, with an over, oversized ego. And he, he cannot dwell in the same place as someone with an oversized ego. And I was recently... I recently listened to a testimony by a former MLB player by the name of Daryl Strawberry, which is where my inspiration for this came from. And he, I want to leave you with something he said. I don't have a direct quote, but he was talking about his ego and how it affected him. And he had an acronym for it, and it was Easing God Out. So I want us to remember that every time we lift ourselves up and put others down, we're easing God out, and he cannot be there with us if we are lifting ourselves above others. Let's kneel for prayer. Father, thank you for this day of blessed with. Thank you for bringing us all together here this morning. Thank you and help us to remember that we need to be humble. We are pushing you out if we lift ourselves up. Further into the service here, just pray with you, all the people that have part in this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for this thought, Spencer. Something that we all can look at in our lives and see where we rate ourselves. Too often times it's probably too high. Thank you. Um, this time it's time for Sunday school. The youth and intermediate can be dismissed. The juniors? Primary? Preschool? And I believe there's a few visiting adults. The men have two classes, one in the front of the auditorium on this side and one in the basement. Feel free to join either or. And the ladies as well have one in the rear and one through the front door here and join either one. And you're dismissed at this time.
Six o'clock, six o'clock. 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 Thank you for the songs that we sang. We pray now that you will be with our discussion this morning. You will pray with Dave as he leads out. May we share our thoughts that we can learn together. We pray that we be with the message bearers. Uh, for the key blessing and help us, Father, to honor and glorify you with our lives from day to day. May you lead, guide, and break us now. For in Christ's name, amen. Amen. Hebrews 11 portrays living faith in the experience of numerous Old Testament people. It is as if someone has asked the writer if there is anyone who really has lived in faith. He listed many. Do you and I also have a good report of faith? In focus to live as strangers and pilgrims, receiving by faith that which cannot be otherwise possessed. Alright. I'm going to assume that most of you, if not all of you, have at least a general familiarity with the chapter. Um, if we were going to read uh, what's here, it would be probably best to read the whole chapter. But I would like to uh, start with you, Steve, and read the first six verses. Faith believes. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <clears throat> for I at the elders of the a good report. Through faith, we understand that the world were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice in Canaan, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he, being dead, yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found, because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Thank you. Things prepared. Oh. Sorry, maybe I wasn't loud enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I at least wanted to read those verses, uh, and it maybe later on, if, if we have time, or it seems appropriate, we can read the rest. Um, but the, these first six verses not only get into the first couple of examples of living by faith, but they provide some foundational material for understanding the rest of the chapter. And so I guess probably the best question to start with is, what is faith? The first verse answers it as the substance of things hoped for, but maybe we need to define that. <laughs> Faith and hope are two different things, aren't they? <clears throat> you can hope for something, but you actually, I mean, is it a realistic hope? Faith is based on realistic. I'm just using the word hope as we use it in everyday language. Sure. Well, I, I hope it's going to rain today. Sure. But you don't have a basis for it. Faith is based on. I, I think there's just a difference in how it's used, but in how we use the word hope today. Yes. Lightly. Yes. Perhaps, perhaps watered down the meaning of it. Kind of is. Yeah. I would like to replace evidence with conviction. Yes, if it's not seen, if it's not seen, is it necessarily evidence? There is evidence, and that does help us to believe, but 
there are certain things we cannot see, and yet we still believe them. I don't want to take away from that the idea of our eternal hope. Correct. But that is based on facts that have taken place in our life. I'm just saying the way we use the word hope today is pretty light. Yes. Compared to that. I'm not sure if there would be a good substitute word for how we usually use hope that way. Uh, you could say, I wish sometimes, but, yeah. or I would like for it to, but <laughs> But on the other hand, faith and hope are related in a way. You can distinguish between them, but they are also related in that it says faith is the conviction or the evidence of things not seen. We usually, when we use hope in a biblical sense, we're usually talking about something in the future that has not occurred yet, although it is certain to happen. Faith is confidence in what we don't see also. But perhaps it's more of a matter of um, current things or things in the past, whereas hope would be focused on the future. things that faith is not. Faith is not, as one cynic defined, a logical belief in the occurrence of the impossible. That's not faith. Not biblical faith, saving faith. It is not believing in spite of evidence. That would be superstition. It is not some feeling we manufacture. Rather, it is our total response to what God has revealed in His Word. Nor is faith unreasonable. Believing God is the most reasonable thing we could ever do. God cannot lie. God does not change. So, is it not the most reasonable thing we can do to simply believe Him? Faith is not a leap in the dark. Demands the surest evidence in the universe and finds it in the Word of God. <clears throat> There's a couple of other ways we could state verse 1. Most of the words are similar, but maybe we can glean another um, aspect of it or, or see a different facet of it. Faith is a sure confidence of things which are hoped for and a certainty of things which are not seen. Faith is a sure confidence of things which are hoped for and a certainty, certainty of things which are not seen. Another one. Now faith is assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. Faith is assurance of things hoped for, a conviction of things not seen. And thirdly, now faith is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. Now, in some ways, those definitions might sound like believing in spite of evidence. It might sound like superstition. But there's a distinction between walking by sight and walking by faith. The other factor is take man's ideas of how the world began, for example, of how earth was formed. People who have decided beforehand that there is no God, 
or at least if there is, that they don't want to be accountable to him. Look at the evidence and come up with the ideas they have. Of the earth is however many billions of years old and life evolves gradually from one form to another. Those who believe in the biblical account of creation in God's word have exactly the same evidence to look at. And they can see how it fits with the true account in Genesis. And I'm not saying we need to spend a lot of time looking up the evidence, but it should not surprise us that if you understand the evidence in light of this account, it does make sense. It does fit together. It is consistent. Again, we'll come back to that a little bit later on as far as who actually has faith, who ex exercises faith. Some more remarks about faith. True Bible faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. Faith is confident obedience to God's word in spite of circumstances and consequences. This faith operates quite simply. God speaks and we hear his word. We trust his word and act on it no matter what the circumstances are or what the consequences may be. The circumstances may be impossible, at least for us, and the consequences frightening and unknown, at least for us, but we obey God's word just the same and believe him to do what is best and what is right. In 2 Chronicles 20.20, 20, it mentions believing God. And also be reading Isaiah 7, 9 after that. This, in 2 Chronicles 20, is when several pagan nations made an alliance, a confederacy, to come against King Jehoshaphat of Judah for battle. And as they were preparing, a prophet told them, tomorrow go down against them, you should not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand you still, and see the salvation of the Lord. That God would deliver them, basically. And in verse 20 it says, And they rose early in the morning, and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. There, Jehoshaphat was exhorting his people to have faith in God, to believe what God had revealed through the prophet, that they would win the victory without even fighting for it. Now in Isaiah, the later descendant of Jehoshaphat was the opposite way. King Ahaz was greatly afraid when the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Syria deployed their forces against him. And the second part of verse 9 says, If ye will not believe, surely ye shall not be established. As Isaiah's warning, his message to Ahaz, if you don't believe God, if you don't believe the prophecy that within three days, Three score and five years, verse 8, shall Ephraim be broken, and it be not a people. If you don't believe that uh, later on in verse 16, before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. If you don't believe that 
Syria will be defeated and Damascus destroyed. You won't be established. You won't be stable. You won't be able to escape this fear that's controlling you. So that's two, two passages from the Old Testament that contrast the choice we have. It shows the choice we have, the contrast between believing God or not believing God. Is there anything about God that makes it impossible for men to believe? Can anyone think of anything? There's some aspects that are hard for us to grasp, but I don't think there's anything that makes it impossible for us to believe. Yes. The difficulty is with the human will. We don't want to believe. In the book, go ahead. Yeah. Say, there is a sense where you know, ask us to do the impossible. Though. You know, you read what you were reading off where faith isn't. It's actually what believing God looks like sometimes. Yes, and we can understand you look what Noah did, look at what Abraham did, look at what Gideon did. You know what I mean. But Jesus is telling the crippled man, stretch out your hand. Yeah, exactly. It's like a leap in the dark. It does. Yes. So from our standpoint, certainly from a lost person's standpoint, an unbeliever, they, they view it that way. It seems that way to them. But once, when, when you come to God and you believe that He is, and as it points out, I don't remember if it's in uh, the lesson commentary here or in the teacher's notes, when you believe that God is who He says He is, who He actually is, then it doesn't look so impossible anymore. Several times in Scripture, God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? And literally, in at least one of those cases, is, it's, is any word too hard for the Lord? In other words, is anything that He has promised, is anything He has said He will do too hard for Him? Rhetorical question. Go ahead. The example of Naaman comes to my mind. I mean, look how difficult it was for him to accept what God, through the prophet, asked him to do. I mean, imagine his faith becoming alive when his skin became like a child's. <clears throat> I don't know if we're too much different from, we're as human as Naaman was probably, but <clears throat> imagine him growing up not in a, what we would call a Christian home, mm -hmm. not being taught about God. Did God make it impossible to believe? No. <laughs> And he gave him the opportunity to learn to know that personal God. Yes. Another fascinating thing about that account is why he made the journey to the land of his enemies in the first place. An Israelite girl that his army had captured. When King Amaziah of Judah defeated the Edomites. He brought the idols of the Edomites to Jerusalem and started worshiping them. And he was rebuked, how foolish is that? You, you're worshiping the gods of a people who couldn't even deliver them. What do you think they can do for you? But in this case, Naaman went to inquire of the God of Israel, one of whose children he captured as a slave. So he was willing to... I don't know, it, it doesn't really give us an indication of how he was feeling or thinking. I don't know if he was grasping at straws, since leprosy was such a dreaded disease, or whether he was willing to give it a fair trial, or whatever the case may be. But it, However, God worked through that. Naaman responded to that little bit of in, in, um, that little bit of calling that God gave him, and then he had to keep responding at each test, at each challenge. It was a glimmer of hope because yes. his life was 
that state. Same reason people go to Mexico today. <coughs> Sorry to bring that in. That's not part of what I said. <coughs> Similar thought process, though, yes. Yes. <coughs> Side, but in that story, Naaman could be assured that that child did not have an ulterior motive. It was pure. I mean, it's just, and the faith of a child can challenge us. Yes. There's, there's no, there's no hidden agenda. There's no ulterior motive, and the child has faith. It's, it's a more pure. You can trust in it a little bit better. And that all tells us that, like, okay, well, in our human mind, we start wondering why you're telling me that. We, we naturally become more cynical and more suspicious as we grow up. Unfortunately. <laughs> Often by far, yes. But this was an example of this young girl loving her enemies, too. That was... Uh, in a way, that was living by faith in and of itself. Faith is confidence in the trustworthiness of God. It is the conviction that what God says is true and that what he promises will come to pass. So there again, our, our starting point must be God's trustworthiness, that he cannot lie, that he cannot change, that he's all-powerful. No word he has promised is too difficult for him. Faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. The world says seeing is believing. That's often the attitude. Seeing is believing. God says believing is seeing. John 11, Jesus told Mary and Martha, did I not say to you that if you believe, you would see? So there's a sense in which faith precedes or comes before understanding. We believe in order to understand. And so those who refuse to take that initial step of faith and believe, the gospel <clears throat> cannot understand living by faith. That's why it looks so illogical to them. So in the text, it's printed in a lesson. It ends with verse 35. And it just barely gets into the the last portion of the chapter, but it does show the transition. It says, after the first line, it says, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, they might obtain a better resurrection. So that's, that's another display or face of faith, so to speak. Not only performing dazzling feats like the first group described, but like the second group, enduring intense suffering. And there's a, a remark here God values the latter as much as the former. <laughs> choice a lot of the time which one of those we face, but the response that's required from us is still the same, exercising faith in God. So let, let's go to the question, who has faith? Who believes? Think in more general terms, in, a, in the broadest sense. 
Who has faith? I think in a broad sense, we all have faith in something. Yes, exactly. It's the one that's willing to put action to it. If you don't act upon your faith, I... Well, it says in James, show me your faith by your works. Yeah. <clears throat> you can believe the house is on fire, but if you don't come out, I don't know if you believe it. I mean, you can say it isn't right. <laughs> Obviously, if you don't come out, you probably don't believe it. Yes. That's the same way with God's promises. So our works, the things we do, generally show where our faith is placed. Now, there are certain times when certain lost people may appear to be doing good things. They may appear to, well, as an example, um, one of the properties where I mow has the phrase, love one another, posted in their flower bed. But there are several other indicators that they are not using that in the biblical sense, that they don't mean what God means by that command. However, nearly every time I mow there, the man that lives there will walk out, remove the obstacles he has in his lawn out of my way so I can mow. And then when I'm done, he'll put them back. So in that regard, in that small area, he's doing to others what he probably would like someone to do to him. Am I saying that has any value? No. But even people who are lost can sometimes, in certain, certain ways, seem to be doing what is good or right. And that's probably a can of worms for another discussion. <laughs> uh, but yes, there's a sense in which everyone has faith in something or someone. Even someone who has decided that God cannot be trusted has faith in their opinion about God. So in that case, it's faith in themselves or faith in whoever fed them that idea. How good is faith? You've probably heard this expression, but how good is faith? What is faith as good as, in other words? good as the object that the faith is in. Correct, yes. Yes. And for example, there are documented cases of women who have so convinced themselves that they are expecting a baby that their bodies respond with the physical effects of pregnancy. The sincerity of their faith, however, does not alter the reality that there is no actual faith. Some members of cults or false religions are fanatically convinced that what they believe is true. Yet, of course, that does not make it so. Yes, faith is, as, is only as good as its object. So once we take care of that and put it in the only worthy object, put our faith in God, there's still, there's still things we do not know. Obviously, we're still limited in our understanding and our knowledge. We don't know the rest of God's plan for our lives, for example. So can God heal, for example? I don't mean that as a trick question or or anything. It's more of a rhetorical question. Can God heal? Exactly, yes. But does God have to heal in order to prove that I have faith? Absolutely. Correct, yes. And uh, sadly, some people are convinced of that and are trying to teach that and distress people who are believing God. <coughs> end up not being healed. God doesn't have to prove anything to us. I was thinking about this. And I know comparisons only for about the rich man. He woke up in hell and he said, you know, send people back to my brothers. And then 
always thought the response was a little bit cold. They have the prophets to believe them. But in essence, that's true. That we have enough evidence. <laughs> believe what we have. God doesn't have to prove anything to us. The proof is there. It's just for us to believe. Proverbs has a lot to say about folly, about foolishness. But it's more a matter of immoral folly. Moral foolishness is not necessarily your brain power is limited. It's that your will refuses to believe. I was gonna say along with that too, like there's things that I'm not allowed to do. That kind of addresses something that's been rolling around in my head. And it's the people who are presented with evidence of God and they refuse to acknowledge the facts. Where, what do we, how do we address those people then? Or do we address them or do we just allow them to proceed in their folly? What's, what's our response? What should be our response in those words? Well, when words fail, our actions are loving, continued kindness will at least show them that we believe that we're living it. Our, our arguments may not convince, but they probably can't deny a holy life and a kind, <coughs> kind-hearted feeling they might get from us. I've, I've heard of cases where outright atheists come in contact with Christians. There was no arguing, just a kind friendship that finally broke them down. They couldn't deny what they were seeing. They, they, could, they could argue all the logical thoughts, but they couldn't deny the kindness for no reason. This person was kind to me. Nothing they could see. No show to Christ. So sometimes, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk, we shouldn't present evidence, but I think there comes a time where they just have to see it, and all we can do is show it. I like the statement that says, teach by example, speak if necessary. That's stretching it a little. We need to talk. Obviously. We need to boldly witness for him. But the life lived is very powerful. Well, we can rest assured if we flip-flop that, we won't go anywhere. You can try to teach. You don't have an example. It's lost. <coughs> so an example is so very important. Yes. You can have the body, as it says in James, but if there's no spirit there, if there's no life that's showing life, no, no fruit being born, then why would they want what you say you have? What good is it to you, let alone to them? And the, yes, there's a sense in which men love darkness rather than light, and many of them even hate the light and won't come to it. But Jesus said we are the light of the world. As, as, he, as we have that indescribable treasure in us, we're shining that light out to those around us. And light enables people to see. Now, that if they don't want to see, they can still try to close their eyes, still try to keep themselves blind. But the light should still be there. And salt is not just a preservative, but it also, unless you use too much of it, you compress it too far. If you use salt, it makes things tastier. And so that in, it can make you thirsty. So there's also a sense in which, yes, as you were saying, when people see something they can't describe, they can't deny the reality of it as effectively. They can try, but it doesn't change the fact that it's real and that they can see that it's real.
we won't turn there in, for the sake of time, but in Ezekiel 33, the, the people liked to come to listen to Ezekiel. They, they thought he had some beautiful flowery language and they, they were inviting each other to come listen to him. And the people liked to listen to listen to Ezekiel, but they had no intention of obeying his words. We should come to the Word of God with the intention of obeying and constantly checking our hearts, lest we fail to reply what we hear. The best response to a sermon is not, that was a fine message, but rather, God has spoken to me, I must do something about it. Basically, everyone lives by faith, in one sense. What does it say in James 2.19 about the devils or the demons? They also believe. Yes. They recognize who God is and also know that they are doomed to everlasting punishment. Several times the demons complained and, and cried out to Jesus, Have you come to torment us before the time? They knew what they were headed for. And in Revelation it says that Satan, uh, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because Satan has come down to you and he knows he only has a short time. So, their intellectual acknowledgement, that the, the faith that they exercise, does not produce willing submission to God. Rather, they try to do as much damage as they are permitted to do until that doom arrives. entitled his commentary chapter on Hebrews 11 as Faith, the Greatest Power in the World. Some have uh, thought that prayer is the greatest power in it. I don't mean to say that that's incorrect or to argue about it. Um, but in one, in one sense, from one standpoint, faith is the greatest power in the world because if you pray, you must pray in faith. Jesus said, you're believing that you have the things you requested. And it's not that faith in and of itself has power. It's not some magic charm or some incantation or something. And it's not just a psychological manipulation. Nor is it something that convinces or coerces God to do something for us. But still, faith is like a hand by which we reach for and receive God's gracious free gift of salvation. But also, by which we access and appropriate God's unlimited, inexhaustible power to live for you. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you to each of you teachers for taking your part. We have two people who met their goal, Kellis Falb, I believe finished his 50 verses, so you can come get your New Testament this time. Good job. You're welcome. And Andrew Sheremy has reached the 100 verse mark, and you can come get your Bible at this time. Good job. Okay, exciting to see children take up the, the work of memorization very well. Good work. This time we'll have three songs, after which ministry will take their place. Let's continue in Hymns of the Church, number 632. Number 632, my faith looks up to thee. Six hundred thirty four. Number six hundred thirty four, standing on the promises. All those who care to miss stand. Oh, yeah. 
be seated. Number 812. Number 812, he leadeth me, O blessed thought. What promises are you standing on this morning? 
we sang that song together, Standing on the Promises. Thank you, Doug, for leading us in those hymns. I think all the songs that we sung very much underscored the Sunday school lesson this morning. Welcome each one to the service here this morning. Welcome the visitors. Thank you for coming, and I trust you can worship with us. Talking about faith, you know, me just looking out across the pews or looking in the parking lot tells me that you had faith this morning. You came here in faith expecting to be fed, not because it says that we're having the fellowship meal today. I mean, that's also a matter of faith. But I trust if you came with your cups turned up, they're already, the bottom half is already running over. That, that was more than filled this morning, and I trust the rest of the cup will be filled this morning. You know, as we analyze our faith this morning, I think verse 16 in our Sunday school lesson should describe us this morning. It says, but now they desire, let's read it, but now we desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called our God, for he hath prepared for us a city. And I trust that's our faith this morning. As I said, there is a fellowship meal being prepared in the basement. I invite all of you to stay in fellowship around the food this afternoon. In two weeks from tonight, there's a chorus that's planning to be here from the Salem and the Meadows of Light congregations. I'm sure there'll be more details coming later, but <clears throat> be in two weeks from tonight. Just remember the reorganization on Wednesday evening for the next Sunday school year. Your voice is important. That's what's important for the next year. Are there any other announcements this morning? Michael. Just a reminder that men's camping is set for Friday, September 8th and Saturday, September 9th at Todd's Farm. Um, try to let one of the committee members know if you can or can't be here. Okay. Harold? There's a sign up sheet for the Haiti benefit option to help the needy people out in Haiti, so if you feel obligated, go ahead and sign your name up. It's coming up here uh, week of Labor Day weekend. Okay. We need priors and also keep a call food line. Opportunity of service. We do have three birthdays this week. Jackson Summers is on Wednesday. Katura Lead is on Thursday. And Cheryl Steiner, which is Mrs. Floyd Steiner, has a birthday on Saturday. My wife already had one birthday this year. One's enough, I think. So this is Mrs. Floyd Steiner. Okay, if there's no other announcements, we'll lift the offering. At this time, the ushers can come forward. So I'll stand for prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you again this morning with thankful hearts for your love and your blessings you have again showered upon us. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of the day that you have again afforded us. There is beauty after the storm. And Lord, we thank you for granting us safety, granting us another day that we can gather in this way to worship you. And Lord, we Invite your presence here this morning again to meet with us in a special way. Pray your blessing on Brother Keith as he stands before us again to minister from your word what you have laid upon his heart. May we have our hearts prepared to receive what you have planned through this morning. We also remember those that can't be here this morning for various reasons, those that have health issues. Pray that you would bless them in a special way and that you would meet their need and that their hearts would also be encouraged this morning. Pray your blessing on the congregation. Just pray that your name would be honored. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Oh. 
morning. Greet each one in Jesus' precious name this morning. Thank you for coming. Did you welcome the visitors? The Lord didn't tell me there was going to be so many visitors this morning because I prepared a message for Sunlight Chapel. I really did. I even told somebody yesterday we're going to be comparing Sunlight Chapel. Now, do I change the sermon? Welcome, visitors. I trust that you can hear a word of the Lord this morning. You can feel the burden of the Lord. Covet your prayers, and thank you for those who have been praying. So, before I give you the title of the message this morning, I need to refer back to the sermon I preached last couple weeks ago, so visitors, if you weren't here, um, fill you in a bit. But those of you who were, we talked about, uh, we were looking for a solution for misery, and I think we found it, so we're not going to go there. But in that, we had Jesus teaching the people, referring to three communities up north that did not repent. And that was a problem. And Jesus had a problem with that, and he was sharing it to the multitude. But he said something about that these churches back there, these communities back there did not repent. That's the subject this morning. I've entitled the message, The Components of Repentance. And components is simply parts that are together to create a whole. Did you know that there's components to repentance? I'll get a little bit of interaction from you this morning. I'm going to ask for a little help here in a little bit. But uh, what did Jesus mean by repent? See, I'm a, I'm a little wondering if those people in those cities knew what Jesus meant when he told them they need to repent. Maybe they didn't know what it meant. Maybe it was a new concept. Maybe it's a new concept for Sunlight Chapel this morning to, to even uh, address the subject of repentance. Is that, a new, is that a new concept? So he said that they did not repent. I asked, did they know what repentance is? And here's why I ask that question. That's a legit question. Do people know what it means to repent? Comes from a, a, a conversation I had this, this last week or so. I'm going to tell you what this conversation is, and I'm going to say this on, at the onset. This, this conversation I had, this illustration is not, is not about the sin. So I had a conversation, and it was, it was, it was about a young man. The conversation was, was about a young man and a young woman who, 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 fell into com, uh, who fell into fornication, who committed fornication in their courting, okay? That's bad, that's not good, that's sin. A child was born. I said, we're not focusing on the sin, Two years later now, they're church members and they're getting married. That's good. That's a good thing. The conversation went on. My comment as I was leaving leaving the conversation was, oh my, I hope they repented. That's what I said. Comment back to me as I walk away is this. The burden of the Lord here this morning. Oh yeah, they have really grown up in the last two years. Folks, is growing up comparable to repentance? Negative. My heart was smoking, a spark was set off. Yeah, they've grown up in the last two years. And I'm afraid that in our churches today, we have people growing up and not repenting, and therefore they are living in sin. We don't grow up and grow out of sin. When we commit sin of fornication, when we commit any type of sin, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and all that, when we commit sin, it needs repented of not growing up.
What kind of strong churches are going to be made out of members who have just only simply grown up and matured and now they're going to be a church member? Is that strong church? Is that strong foundation? Is that something to hand on down to the next generation? Oh, we have people here today. We have children here today. What are we going to hand on down to our next generation? Tell them they better grow up? So here we have it. The question I'm going to ask you. What is, what is repentance? So we're going to start with a young generation. Children, look up here. Kelly or Kylie, what is repentance from you? What did your mommies and daddies teach you? What is repentance? Tell me. When you're sorry for your sins, when you're sorry for something, thank you. Simple. Next generation. Up here. Kutur. What is repentance? You can say the same thing if you want. That was a pretty good answer. Do you agree? That generation is getting taught. Um, leaders, Willis, what is repentance? True sorrow for your sins. True sorrow for your sins. That doesn't sound anything like growing up to me. Brother Virgil, what were you taught and what do you believe repentance is today? Asking God to forgive my sins. Asking God to be, forgive your sins. We're being taught, we've been, an instruct, we've been instructed, are we practicing it? See, see repentance is something that... Uh, takes place and it, it needs to be practiced. It needs to be practiced in our churches. Thank you for helping me out on that. Repentance is simply to turn from sin and to feel sorry for something that we've done. And then the word penitent is to turn away from Sorry, is the feeling sorrow for sin or offenses. It's extremely hard to repent without a sorrow for what we are repenting of. I might refer to something this morning, and if you hear it, I might refer to something about incomplete repentance. I might say that, or I might say complete repentance. I might say that this morning. Okay, confess. So there's a part of, there's a part of, of repentance, and it's called confession. To confess is to acknowledge, right there we have it, to acknowledge or disclose one's misdeeds. Now that sounds a little light. It is to acknowledge or disclose one's faults. That's a little bit of a light uh, definition. But it's to acknowledge or disclose one's sins. Sin! Acknowledging it to God. So we confess and we Repent. All right, we need to move on. Today, look, today, repentance is a gospel requirement. It is a gospel requirement for being saved. It is a gospel requirement for right living, is repentance. We said that is to be sorry for something that we did, to be sorry for a wrongdoing, to be sorry for our sin. We are sinners, we sin. We're going to look at that this morning. In case we thought that the church is exempt from sinning, I want to clarify that this morning, if I can, if you're open to that. By faith, we talked about this morning, by faith I turn to Jesus Christ, and I'm turning away from wickedness and dead works, whichever side you want that this morning. So we turn to Jesus away from sin. That is repentance. We turn to Jesus. Nothing else will suffice. You can turn to, a, uh, what is that, AA Anonymous or Alcohol Anonymous, whatever that is. You can turn to things like that. That is not repentance. Turning to Jesus Christ, turning from wickedness, turning from dead works of things we do and the things that we don't do and we ought to. So, I said this. Well, first, 
Repentance is the opening message of John the Baptist. You open the New Testament, you come to John the Baptist, and he's off and running with repentance. And then we have Jesus Christ coming on the scene after his temptation, and he begins to preach, he begins to preach repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So that was fairly important to Jesus. But did his audience know what that meant? And then we have the message of the Holy Spirit in Acts, and it was to repent. And it's a privilege to stand here this morning and to preach a message on repentance. That's what Jesus did. So, is this repentance a New Testament concept? So, so when Jesus was preaching and John was preaching and the Holy Spirit through men was preaching, repentance, was that a new concept? Did they get it? You think that was brand new and that, 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 that's brand new for the New Testament? That means no. It is not something new. What is new is the kingdom of heaven was at hand. I'm talking about repent. And when Jesus says that those cities didn't repent, why didn't they? Well, that can be another subject. Turn with me to Ezra chapter 9. See, we're going to look in the Old Testament to see if these people here in the New Testament that Jesus was preaching to, to see if they were legit, uh, ignorant, to see if they were actually really ignorant to what repentance means. No, we find repentance in the Old Testament. So if Jesus was preaching and John was preaching repentance, what did they use for an illustration and an example to their people as they preached? Their forefathers, the children of Israel... The bygone days, the failures, the repentance and then the failures, the repentance and then the failures. That's what Jesus and John could use and would use that the people would understand God instituted repentance, accepts that, that is his his way back in the Old Testament. So what we have here in Ezra chapter 9 is Ezra leading people to repentance. So what we have is the, they went into captivity. So these are God's people, children of Israel, go into captivity, and now they're sent back. See, Jesus, or God told them they would, they would come back one day. So Ezra is the privilege to bring some people back. Ezra is a priest, and Ezra is a scribe. That's important. Ezra knew the scriptures. This is Old Testament. We're talking about God's people. We're talking about sunlight here. In Ezra, God's people called back and established in Jerusalem. Did you know that that was very high on the list of the Hebrews or the Jewish people was to be able to come back to the holy city Jerusalem? That's pretty important to them. Today we're the people of God. So we're going to have to fit ourselves into this text of the people of God. So Ezra is leading the people in confession and repentance. I said the title of the message was the four components to repentance. Here we have it. Four elements of repentance is this. And if you want to write them down, you ought to. I'm going to say them a couple times here. But the four elements of repentance, the components that make up a whole, and we must be aware of these, is number one is the conviction component. And we have the contrition. Now that's a big word, but contrition is simply that godly sorrow that is actually visible. A remorse has to be part of it. The conviction is the conscious guilt. That's when all of a sudden God gets a hold of us and shakes us and our heart speeds up and we can't calm down. God gets a hold of us because we're sinning. We sinned. So you have the conviction, the contrition, Number three is confession. Calling out sin as it is. Identifying sin. And I don't know if you've ever prayed with people who who are repenting, but we ask them to confess and identify the sin that the Spirit of God is pointing out in their life. That is confession. We call it sin. We acknowledge it to God. Okay, that was confession. Uh, Number four is the biggie. Restitution. Oh, that's probably the hardest work of repentance is restitution. 
It might involve some other, somebody else. It might involve writing what was wrong. That's what restitution is. Doing whatever it takes to make wrongs right is part of repentance. So you have four components. We're going to find them here in our text, and hopefully we get through it. And we want to find Sunlight Chapel here in Ezra. All right? I think we're ready to read Ezra chapter 9. So we have them. I'm going to try and read this uninterrupted, unless the Spirit leads differently, so that you get the story. This is a Bible story. But before we begin, it says, Now when these things were done. So we're starting in after Ezra had done all these things with bringing the people back to Jerusalem. All right? They did a lot of things before here. We're not going there. The writer here says, oh, the other thing, when, when Ezra, Ezra's writing, so every time it says I in here, it's not me, it's, it's Ezra. I want you to understand that. So now when these things were done, the princess came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land, doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. You'll find those names in Judges also. For they, take, for they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers have been chief in this trespass. And when I heard this thing, I rent my garment and my mantle and plucked off the hair of my head and of my beard and sat down astonished. Then were assembled unto me every one that trembled at the words of the God of Israel because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose up from my heaviness and rent my garment and my mantle. I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God. And said, O my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, our trespasses growing up unto the heavens. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to captivity, to the spoil, to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant, to escape, to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the king of Persia, to give us a reviving to set up the house of our God, to repair the desolation thereof, and to give us a wall in Jerusalem, in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servant the prophet, saying, The land unto which ye go to possess it is a clean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance for your children forever. And after all this has come upon us for for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that seeing that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this. Should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldst not thou be angry with us till thou hast consumed us, so so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remained yet escaped. As it is this day, behold, we are before thee in trespass, for we cannot stand before thee this day. Now what if we stopped reading there? What if we stopped reading there? What if Ezra Ezra wouldn't have recorded chapter 10? We would have incomplete repentance, folks. 
They have, they have conviction here. They have acknowledged that these are sinful. We have to read on. We have to read on. Verse, chapter 10. Act like that's not there. Now when Ezra prayed, and when he had confessed, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a very great congregation of men and women and children, for the people wept sore. And Shechaniah the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, answered and said unto Ezra, We have trespassed against our God and taken strange wives of the people of the land. Yet now there is hope in Israel concerning this thing. Now therefore let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives as such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord and of those that trouble at the, tremble at the commandment of our God. And let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We also will be with thee. Be of good courage and do it. Then arose Ezra and made the chief priests and the Levites and all Israel to swear that they should do according to his word, this word. And they swear. Then Ezra rose up from the house, rose up from before the house of God, and went into the chambers of Johanan, the son of Eliashib. And when he came thither, he did eat no bread nor drink water, for he mourned because of the transgression of them that had been carried away, and they made proclamation throughout Judah and Jerusalem unto all the children of captivity that they should gather themselves together unto Jerusalem. And whosoever would not come within three days according to the counsel of the princes and the elders and all the substance should be for, forfeited and himself separated from the congregation of those that have been carried away. Then all Judah, then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem within three days. And it was the ninth month on the tw 20th day of the month and all the people sat in the streets of the house of God, trembling because of this matter and for the great rain. And Ezra the priest stood up and said unto them, Ye have transgressed and have taken strange wives to increase the trespass of Israel. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord God of your fathers, and do his pleasure and separate yourselves from the people of the land and from the strange wives. Then all the congregation answered and said with a loud voice, As thou hast said, so must we do. But the people are many. And it is a time of much rain. We are not able to stand without. Neither is this a work of one day or two. For we are many that have transgressed in this thing. Now, let now our rulers of all the congregation stand. Let all them which have taken strange wives in our cities come at appointed times. And with them the elders of every city and the judges thereof, until the fierce wrath of our God for this matter be turned from us. Now we have a, a few names here. And only Jonathan, the son of Ashel, and Jezariah, the son of Tivka, were employed about this matter. And Meshalem and Shebathiah, the Levites, helped them. And the children of captivity did so. And Ezra the priest, with certain chiefs of the father, after the house of their father, all of them by their names, were separated and sat down on the first day of the tenth month to examine the matter. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. That was a long story, but we needed to read it. So here we have Sunlight Chapel here. And I said that as we look at for Sunlight Chapel here, in the text and in the context of these verses, it is not about the sin. It's not the specific sin. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. This is an account that we want to draw an analogy from. We will draw an example from of true repentance. So let's have that understood. So here we have in the first verse, I said Israel leads, leads in repentance. Here we have Ezra being notified of something very terrible and tragic. The princes came to me, the, saying this, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves. Here is the conviction. And I believe because Ezra was leading the people in, in, over the bygone days here, they saw that they were living in sin. They, at this moment, they feel the convicting power that they are living in violation of God's law, and that is simply that they have married the heathen women. Now look who was marrying the heathen women. It was the people. 
That is the Jews. That is God's people. That is, that is the church. Today, that's the church, God's people. Now, who's marrying the heathen women in church? It says, and the priests and the Levites, the church leaders are involved in marrying the heathen women. The church leaders have not separated themselves from the heathen women. Now, I said it's not so much about the sin. But let's look at this. There's no separation anymore. Inger intermingling. The leaders were also involved. Leaders, we set an example. I want to ask a couple questions. Since the leaders did it, did it make it right? Was it right in God's eyes because the leaders did it? No, it was sin. So if the people observe the leaders intermarrying with the heathen women, they're going to intermarry with the heathen women. They're following their leaders. Now, does that make it right? Does it make it right for you to intermarry because the leaders did? No, it is still sin, and God is still God. And it was by, we read, it was but by the grace of God that they came to this opportunity to where they felt pricked that they sinned. That is the grace of God. So the conviction is they were intermarrying. And it gives all the, 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 the heathen nations. Brethren, we're not about to go out and marry the heathen women, are we? But we sure do like to look, right? That's where the challenge lies. So is it any better to look at the heathen women than to marry them? No, it is sin. No, we're not going to be marrying the heathen men, are we? We're not going to go out and marry heathen men. But do we cause him to look? Am I the reason? Am I the object for causing him to look? And is it my immodesty that is causing the man to look? Since the people did it for generations and generations, all the way back there to Judges, did it make it right? No. So we have that cleared. Sinning for a long period of time and growing up doesn't make it not sinful. It is sin. The conviction is here. We're rubbing shoulders with society every day, folks. And we have the potential to be influenced by society. And when we are influenced and it is sin, then we must repent. We read that we're pilgrims and strangers, so we can possibly, it is possible to live here and not be influenced by the world, all right? Well, these people were influenced, and now we have the mess. Today we have in the churches the mess of Divorce and remarriage, divorce and remarriage, children with divorce and remarriage, and it goes on and on. That's the mess the church has today. Back here in this church, it was marrying heathen, simply going next door and marrying a heathen. Well, she was my neighbor. I knew her from, from little on up. I grew up beside her. I know her. I know she's a good woman. She was a heathen, and they married. God called it sin. We're not here to say whether that was sin or not. God called it sin, held him accountable, brought him to conviction. And now, now Ezra finds out about this. I had to wonder if he did not notice this. Was this new to him? I don't know. It doesn't matter. But you'd sure think if there was a Jewish man walking around with an Egyptian woman, there would be some question, right? So Ezra just now Comes to, comes to realize that this, this takes place. Now notice with the conviction, they name the sin here. They have taken their daughters for themselves and for their sons. That was, that was the sin that we're looking at here. They mingled themselves. The hand, in verse 2, the hand of the princes and rulers have been chief in this trespasses. The leaders were chief. Fathers, you're leaders. 
there's a huge responsibility on your shoulders. What you do is sending a message to your wife and to your family that it's okay and that it's right. And if it was sin, it needs repented of. And if it was sin that is being accepted, then the next generation is going to indulge. They're going to say it's okay. So the leaders here were chief. The leaders are responsible. The leaders need to repent. Did you know that? Leaders have to repent. Now, going with this conviction, I said that they were notified here, or to be made known, it says in verse 4 that this group of people were, was absolutely trembling at the Word of God because the Word of God and the law, they knew it, and they were trembling because of the sin that they committed, and so that conviction caused them to tremble. That's not new to us. We have revival meetings. The evangelist comes, the evangelist preaches, and we are convicted of sin in our life, and the Holy Spirit is specific that we did such and such, and that is could be whatever. It is sin, it is sin. And we tremble. Why do we tremble? Because it, that's the goodness of God that we tremble. Trembling sends a message, and so they, these people are for real. Sorry and repenting. So that is the conviction. Now we want to move on to contrition. In verse 3, Ezra displays a brokenness, and it's a beautiful picture here. He displays a brokenness, a remorse. He, he um, displays shame in the presence of the people. Now, his behavior is being observed. He, being a leader, the religious leader, is being observed by the people, and he is smitten by the sins of the people, and he does not exclude himself from their sin. He's a leader, leading them to repentance. And he knows the, he knows the law, so here is contrition. I see in verse 4, with contrition that the people were moved and they gathered on their own accord. They gathered willingly in verse 4. They assembled together. They want help. They want help. They need help. They need lead in repentance. In verse 5, he continues to mourn before God. And notice he is sitting, mourning. He is sitting and he is mourning. He's considering, he's thinking, he's meditating. The Spirit today moves when we take time and we sit in his presence. And so he convicts us as we're sitting there. Now in verse 6, in verse 5, he rises up. So he goes from sitting to casting himself down. This is Ezra, completely broken over the sin that the people have just now exposed. So he speaks to God, expressing his grief and sorrow, including himself in his prayer to the Lord. He's including himself in this sin. He's admitting sin. Was he a part of that intermarrying? No, he's a part of God's people. He is not above them. He recognizes past failures as he prays to God. He recognizes past failures and the consequences of sin. Now verse 8. Quickly here, let's look at this. Now for a little space, grace has been shown. So he recognizes that they were spared that captivity, and they have this moment in time to come back to Jerusalem, that this is their space of grace to come back to God, to become pure and holy people for him again. Today, in the church, today is your day. Your space of grace is today. We don't know that we have a space of grace tomorrow, but the space of grace is today to repent of our sins. The problem is, we think we have a lot of space of grace, and so we keep putting off repentance. But Ezra is very clear that it is a short space of time. We have a little space of grace, and that is where the, that's where the Spirit of God works, is in that little space of grace. And he convicts us. A little space of grace. Our, great, our space of grace is today. And it says there that God gives them a little reviving in their bondage. This is their opportunity. And reviving is being kindled right here. Revival is being kindled. 
More could be said about that verse. Let's move on with contrition. So verse 11 and 12, we have, we have Ezra rehearsing what God commanded and required of his people. See, they were not ignorant. And Ezra knew exactly what God required about not, intermi- not intermarrying with the heathens. If you do, you will become like them. See, I don't think we can quite fully grasp the sin that these people were committing because of the holiness of God. He said, don't marry the heathens. We want to keep a pure people. That's the church today. He wants the church to be pure. Therefore, we have to repent of sin and the church can remain pure. If we don't understand the holiness of God and we're very flippant about sin and we want to come into his presence in that manner, we don't have the healthy fear of God. So God was wanting these people to remain pure. And they had suffered consequences in the past. In verse, um, let's see which verse it is here. 13. Ezra says, And recognize that thou, God, hast punished us less than our iniquities deserve. He could understand that God should have destroyed him and did not. And if we could get that concept today as we sit in the pews and the gospel is being preached and the evangelist is preaching and we're being convicted that God, is his mercy has not given us what we deserve. But we take that for granted so many times. God has not given us what we deserve. And in verse 15... We have Ezra simply pleading for mercy. That is true contrition. Pleading that God would one more time have mercy on my poor soul because I sinned this week. I violated God's law. I violated God's word. I violated my vows to, I made to, that I made to God. I'm in violation. Would God have mercy on me? It's contrition. All right? So all that. Ezra. In chapter 9, conviction and contrition. Ezra leading the people to something better. Now we go into chapter 10. We have confession. In verses 1 through 11. So now we go into chapter 10. Ezra here has confessed for all the people. So we have the leader leading out in confession to God for the people. But that wasn't personal. Today, we leaders cannot confess for you. We can take and we can pray with you. And we can counsel and we can share. But we can never put those words of confession into your mouth. You must confess on a personal level. In Isaiah Isaiah? Ezra realized that. We want to see that. So he's praying and confessing. We, we, we can pray for the church. We pray for the church. We pray for the people. We see that he was weeping and broken. So when we're serious with God and we're repenting and willing to repent, many times there's tears involved. and That's right and true. That is a sign of brokenness. So children, if you ever see people that are are coming forward when the preacher asks them to, they come up here and they stand up here. You ever see that, children? And they're always crying and weeping. That's scriptural. We're allowed to do that. When we're sorry for our sins, we cry. And we come forward and we want somebody to pray with us. And that's why we're crying. Ezra was crying and it says that the people wept sore. So the people were crying worse than Ezra. These people were for real. These people were sorry. We know it was a large group. I want to notice something here in verse 3 as we talk about confession. You know, in revival meetings, say it's the community revival meetings where there's just a lot of people there. The preacher gives an invitation. Somebody has to go first. Somebody has to break the ice. Somebody has to come to the altar and lead the way. Somebody has to make the first move. It seems like once somebody makes the first move, then it, and then it makes it easier to, for others or something like that. It's happening here. It happens right here. So it 
Shechaniah, verse 2, is that man. He comes out and he tells Ezra, he confesses this is right. This is what we did. This is what we're involved in. You know what he said? But there is hope. There is always hope and repentance, even in the Old Testament. He sees there's hope. So he comes forward. He wants to experience that hope. He wants to make it real for everybody. So he comes to Ezra, and, and he makes the first move. And he kind of draws the people with him. So, yep, that's, that's for sure. That's what we did. Let's, let's, let's do what we have to do. Get right with God. He gives the remedy that he believes that restitution will need to be made. It says here that we have taken strange wives. Um, according to the counsel of the Lord, that those that tremble, let it be done according to the law. He wants to do it according to the law. That's, that's his, his solution, that his suggestion. But look at this. In verse 4, this fellow says, Arise, for this matter belongeth unto thee. We will be with thee. He was going to assist those that want to repent. And that's how it is today in the church. We come alongside and help those who want to repent, and we give them courage. He says, Be of good courage and do it. Just come forward and repent. We will come with you. We will be with you, but we cannot do it. That's almost New Testament stuff there. So he gives a remedy. Now in verse 11, Ezra now calls the people to confess. I want you to see that. So up until this point, he was pleading with God. Now he comes back to the people. Now therefore make confession unto the Lord. It is your responsibility to confess. It is your sin. It is your guilt that is on your shoulder. You confess. And nothing has changed since then that we as individuals must confess our sins. Ezra did. He showed him how. He showed him how. So now we have him requiring them to repent, and the people agreed to do so, and the people agreed here to put away their strange wives. It sounds terrible this morning, folks. Putting away the, the, the wives and the children that were born unto them from strange women. That is not enough for the leaders to confess for you. So this decision was made together, and all the people that were involved came together. Verse 8. So they called and said, everybody needs to gather together. This is what we're going to do. We're going to repent and confess before God. Everybody who is violated the law must come together, is the call. Well, what if they don't? What if they don't come? Verse 8. And whosoever would not come within three days, according to the counsel of the princes, um, we don't have to repent. We don't have to repent. The call is to repent, but we don't have to. Nobody's going to make us. We can go right on sinning and never repent. We don't have to repent. The people didn't have to come. The people didn't have to come and split up with their wives. But there were consequences. They were going to lose their inheritance. They were going to be separated from the people of God just like today. The church has to do that today. When there's sinners who don't repent, they need to be separated. That's in the Old Testament. You don't have to come. This is when we're meeting. This is when we're going to repent to God. And if you're not going to be there, you lose your land. That's what it means. They're going to lose their place in Jerusalem, their inheritance, their, their, their parcel, their peace. It's going to be taken from them. They're going to be separated. Now they're back outside of Jerusalem again. Don't worry, folks. It says in the scriptures that all men came that day. We don't have to worry about what happened. Verse 9, then all the men of Judah and Benjamin gathered. Don't worry, they were there. They were going to repent. Repentance is not easy. So all the people were agreed, and we're going to make restitution. Restitution. Here we are. 
Number four, the fourth part of repentance, restitution. It, it's, it's almost enough to make us stay in our pews. It, the, the thought of restitution almost makes us stay seated. When the call of God is so strong on our hearts and the conviction is so strong that we're actually trembling, it's the restitution that's going to make us want to stay seated. Restitution takes intentional effort and time. Folks, this is some of the most... Um, what's the word I want? This, this setting here with restitution is some of the most uh, heart-wrenching, heart-rendering. Um, we can't hardly understand God's mercy here. But mom and dad have to separate. Mom and dad and children have to separate. The consequences of sin is far greater than what we ever thought. But they have to separate. We agreed, and we're repenting, and they have to separate. We can hardly understand that, folks. But we know that it, it takes time. It says that this is a great matter, and it cannot be taken done in, in one or two days. This is not a matter for one or two days. And it's a time of rain. We can't come out here and divide up and separate at, at, in one day. Restitution takes time. Sometimes we repent and restitution is an ongoing period of time when we are making restitution for our sin, to make things right. God has forgiven, but there's restitution. So it took approximately two months. Verse 17. More could be said about that separating of people. But we come to verse 17. Ezra, Ezra leading the people in repentance. And they made an end with all the men that had taken strange wives by the first day of the first month. And they were finished. They had separated all the heathen wives and the children. It was done. Think about this. Why? Why, if they confessed and repented in such a godly way, would God require families to be split up? We want to reason that out, don't we? If, he, if, if they repent and they're so sorry for their sin, why must they separate? It's because God does not change to appease man's sin. That's why it's still meant don't intermarry. And that's the way it is with our sin when we repent. But we don't give it up. We live with it. The alcoholic that repents, but keeps, the, keep, keeps a case in the refrigerator in case. See, they go on living with their heathen wives after they repent. What was gained? The influence was still there. The ungodly idolatry was still there. The sin was still there. Restitution. It's tough. It's hard. It's required. They agreed. We do not know what took place after that. God is sovereign. God is holy and requires his children to live holy lives. So we need to bring this to a close. I know I stand between you and lunch. The verses that I didn't read. I find it really difficult to read the remaining verses. What we have in verses 18 through 44, folks, is a record of all the men who sinned. We have a record here, folks, of all the men who married heathen women. Now imagine that. Do you think these men, when they repented there, do you think they ever thought that their name would be recorded in Scripture forever that they married a heathen woman and it stands recorded in Scripture. I looked at that verse, I looked at that many times, and I'm like, come on, Eliezer. You knew it isn't going to work to marry the Egyptian. You know, kind of find fault with them. This is a list of sinners right here. And their sin is right there, bold. They've married heathens. Folks, this morning, 
How about it? Let's, let's do it. Let's write it right here. Let's put our name on here. And let's, let's say what our sins are. And we'll put it back in there next Sunday. We'll pull it out. Yep. Look what we did. A record of our sin. I had to change my thought. I don't know what this would all say, guys or brethren. But I had to change my thought. This is a list of men who repented and are, 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 are free from bondage. These are, this is a list of men who repented. This is, not, this is not the list of men who married heathen women, so to speak. This is a list of men who are documented in the Word of God that they repented. It cost them a lot to get their name in here. Cost them their heathen wife and all their children. But they stand before God purged. I had to change my view of that list of men. The church is looking for men like that today. Men who repent. Men who practice repentance. They're sorry for their sin. And we sin today. It's not a once and done thing. We sin today. We don't want to. We don't want to practice sinning, but we sin. And all of a sudden, God speaks and we realize, I know, folks, I know that that was wrong. And what do we do at that moment? I trust we repent. I trust that we would know where in our minds, consider the fact that we'll let it go a while. We'll let it mature. We'll just grow out of this one. It doesn't work. Thank you for your attentiveness. Thank you for giving me some extra time that I took anyway. But the burden of the Lord is this morning is that the repentance is the gospel requirement for holy living. Shall we have a song? For
Beautiful, just beautiful. You sang like you meant it. Thank you for that song. That's a perfect way to end the service. By the grace of God, we can stand redeemed. Shall we stand? I'm going to remember the noon meal here, and then you can make your way to the basement for lunch. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to gather here today. We thank you for the scriptures and teaching us how to repent, teaching us your desire that we repent, that we would live pure and holy lives. And as we go through this week, as we go through these days, may your spirit be faithful in prompting us and convicting us, teaching us and showing us the way that you would have us to go. I pray now that as we partake of the noon meal, we'd have thankful hearts. We thank you for providing the noon meal. May you bless those that worked and labored and are laboring for the meal. Bless our fellowship around it. We thank you for everyone that is here today. I pray that you would search our hearts, know us, and try us. And if there's a need of repentance here today, that you would not give rest until repentance is found. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.